Hello, everyone, and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Ananda Marga Elementary Philosophy. And this is a reading of the eighth chapter titled Intuitional Practice and Its Necessity. An all-round effort for emancipation from the bondage of prakriti is sadhana, or intuitional practice. The question now is to determine if complete emancipation from the bondage of prakriti is possible. It would otherwise be only a waste of time to carry out intuitional practices, sadhana. In an earlier chapter dealing with the creation, it was explained that the qualified supreme entity, Saguna Brahma, which was called Prajapati because of being under the influence of prakriti, Bada Purusha, became free, mukta, from the bondage by carrying out intuitional practices, sadhana, and was called hiriyana garva. It can thus be concluded that those under the bondage of prakriti can attain freedom with the help of intuitional practice, sadhana. Freedom from the bondage of prakriti means attaining the nirguna status. It is only then that one is completely emancipated from the bondage of prakriti. Prajapati attained the status of Hiryana Garbha, that is, he became free of the bondage of prakriti only by doing sadhana, intuitional practice. Emancipation from the influence of prakriti is thus possible, and the only method of attaining it is sadhana, intuitional practice. The story of creation shows that in the phase of movement from crude to subtle, the unit consciousness reflects itself clearly by taking shelter in a body made of the five rudimental factors derived from the qualified supreme entity. On its reflecting completely, the unit consciousness also gets a mind due to the qualifying influence of prakriti. The three principles of prakriti, sentient, mutative, and static, give its mind the three functional forms of mahatattva, ahangtattva, and chitta, respectively. Chitta is further projected through the ten physical organs, or indriyas. This means that the unit consciousness, because of gradual increase in the qualifying influence of prakriti, got metamorphosed as mahatattva, or buritattva. Then with the increase of influence, it became cruder as ahangtattva, till finally it became even more crude as chitta. And its chitta with the help of the ten physical organs or indriyas, started projecting in the form of crude physical actions. The influence of prakriti gained a hold on unit consciousness gradually, and hence, in order to get out of her hold, the unit consciousness will have to retract gradually. It will have to first retract from chitta to ahangtattva, then from ahangtattva to mahatattva, and finally, the metamorphous projection as mahatattva will have to be withdrawn into unit consciousness for emancipation from the hold of prakriti. Thus, intuitional practice is intended gradually to withdraw the qualifying influence of prakriti so that she is no longer able to impose her qualities on consciousness. It was said earlier that it is consciousness, purusha, in human beings which has to carry out sadhana, intuitional practice. Hence, the preliminary sadhana, intuitional practice, has to be carried out by the consciousness metamorphosed as chitta, by which this projection of consciousness retracts into ahangtattva. This leaves only ahangtattva and mahatattva. So the next entity to carry out sadhana is the consciousness metamorphosed as ahangtattva. It is to free itself from the qualifying influence of the principle of prakriti, creating it by its dissolution into mahatattva. Thus, only mahatattva, or pure feeling of I, remains. This is a stage of savikalpa samadhi, where only mahatattva, or pure I feeling, indistinguishable from the cosmic I, remains. After this mahatattva carries out sadhana and dissolves itself, into the unit consciousness completely, freeing consciousness from the qualities imposed by the influence of prakriti, it achieves emancipation from the bondage of prakriti.
and that is called Nirvakalpa Samadhi. Thus, the sadhana or intuitional practice that human beings have to carry out begins with the chitta, to be followed by a hang tattva, and finally by maha tattva, which emancipates consciousness completely from the qualifying influence of prakriti. It is not easy to liberate mind from the qualifying influence of prakriti. Human beings have a unit consciousness, and hence, is unit prakriti only which influences it? It is not so. The consciousness in Irguna Brahma, non-qualified supreme entity, is not influenced by prakriti, because there she is the weaker counterpart. Since infinite prakriti is not able to influence infinite consciousness, unit prakriti would not be in a position to influence unit consciousness either. It would be incorrect to presume that in the qualified state of Brahma, it is unit prakriti which qualifies the unit consciousness. If this is not so, which prakriti does qualify the consciousness? As without prakriti qualifying it, there will be no Saguna Brahma, qualified supreme entity. It may be assumed from this that two units of prakriti qualify one unit consciousness, as a single unit prakriti is the weaker counterpart of unit consciousness. This would also lead to the assumption that infinite cosmic consciousness is being qualified by two infinite prakritis. This is not logical and cannot happen. Prakriti is a unique force, and it can never be divided into units or parts. Hence, only infinite prakriti can influence every unit consciousness. If infinite prakriti qualifies every unit consciousness by her infinite qualifying influence, then unit consciousness has to fight against infinite prakriti for emancipation. It has to fight against and defeat infinite prakriti for emancipation. And hence, sadhana is not an easy task. Prakriti is a composite force, which is always restless. And so the creation is ever-changing. All that is manifested in this Shriti Chakra, cycle of creation, is metamorphous cosmic consciousness. And hence, changes in the cycle of creation also change the cosmic mind accordingly. That is, the cosmic mind also becomes restless, and that brings about changes in the flow of creation. But the changes in the flow of creation are slow and gradual. As Prakriti takes quite some time to bring about a change in the infinite mind. It is only because of cosmic consciousness being infinite that changes are gradual and not very quick. Even the ever-mutative Prakriti takes some time to bring about a rotation of the entire infinite cosmic mind in order to bring about a change. While bringing the cosmic mind under greater bondage, Prakriti also influences the unit mind, bringing about unfathomable restlessness and movement in it. Due to the complete influence of infinite prakriti, the unit becomes extremely disturbed and mutatory. The fickleness and ever-changing nature of the mind needs no description as everyone understands it well. This quality in the human mind is the sole gift of prakriti, who imparts to all that she creates her quality of perpetual restlessness. The perpetual restlessness of prakriti makes her creation, the unit mind, also disturbed throughout its existence. At times, or in some places, it may be more agitated, while at others, it may be less disturbed. Restlessness, being a quality imposed by Prakriti, will vary with the influence of Prakriti. The mind is less agitated or disturbed where the influence of Prakriti is less. Her influence is the least in Mahatattva and the most in Chitta, and hence, the former is less restless than the latter. Sadhana or intuitional practice lessens the influence of prakriti on unit consciousness, and with that, the restlessness of mind also lessens. Prakriti alone is responsible for imparting disturbance to the mind, and with the waning of her influence, the vacillation of mind also lessens. Hence, the vacillation of mind cannot be studied unless unit consciousness is emancipated from the influence of prakriti. Studying the vacillation of the mind 
and developing concentration of mind is the same thing. Concentration of mind is thus not possible as long as unit consciousness is not liberated from the qualifying influence of prakriti. This is the aim of sadhana or intuitional practice also. To concentrate the mind, it would be necessary to liberate, first of all, its most exterior manifestation, the citta, from the influence of prakriti. The next would be ahang tattva, and finally mahatattva, or buri tattva, must be liberated from her influence. The mind spread in citta, ahang tattva, and mahatattva must gradually be withdrawn from them, and then alone will it be concentrated. Thus, concentration of mind is nothing else but sadhana or intuitional practice, which liberates units from the influence of prakriti. How far concentration of mind leads to emancipation needs to be determined. Complete withdrawal of mind from its manifestations is concentration of mind, but it is not annihilation of mind. Mind is created due to the qualifying influence of prakriti over unit consciousness. And as long as mind exists, the influence of prakriti must be present. Concentration of mind does not mean emancipation from the bondage of prakriti. It is only the surest path leading to emancipation. Even with complete concentration, mind exists, but the influence of prakriti is completely unable to cause restlessness. The qualifying influence of the principle of prakriti is the least on mahatattva, and in a concentrated mind, only mahatattva is left, as the other two counterparts, ahangtattva and citta, are withdrawn into it. As long as the mind is not annihilated, mahatattva or buritattva will exist. Mahatattva is the knowledge of existence, or pure feeling of I. Hence, concentration of mind is not complete emancipation, moksha or mahanirvana. Concentration of mind is only savikalpa samadhi, where the only feeling that remains is, I am that. The creation becomes crude due to the increasing influence of prakriti. When the influence is greater, it is cruder, while with less influence, it is subtle. So in one's mind, mahatattva is the subtlest and citta the crudest. It is with mind only that sadhana or intuitional practice for emancipation has to be carried out. The crudeness or subtlety depends on the degree of the influence of prakriti, and with the decrease in her influence, the mind will retract into the subtle. Ordinarily, the mind is absorbed into the things of the world, which come into being as a result of the highest order of the influence of prakriti on cosmic citta. Mind being absorbed in the external expression of crudeness undergrows even greater influence of prakriti. It was seen earlier that with complete reflection of unit consciousness, human mind attains freedom of action, and with that arises the wish to overthrow the yoke of prakriti. So prakriti created two illusory opposing concepts or ideas called maya. These are avidya maya and vidya maya. People who make use of their freedom in the pursuit of vidya maya soon get back to the supreme rank, because vidya maya directs the mind to the subtle. While those who take recourse to avidya maya keep on experiencing the reactions of their actions, karma phala, which makes them roam in the thought waves of the qualified supreme entity. Avidya maya drags and absorbs the mind into crude objects. Avidya maya really acts as the weapon with which Prakriti keeps the mind under her subjugation by binding it to crude things of the world. Sadhana, or intuitional practice, leads one to freedom from the bondage of Prakriti, and the mind becomes subtle. The decrease in the influence of Prakriti takes the mind toward subtlety, and the Sadripu and Astapasha no longer bother and bind it. Just as the decrease in the influence of Prakriti releases one from the fetters and influence of Avidya Maya. The converse, that the release from the fetters and influence of Avidya Maya should decrease the influence of Prakriti, is also true. Avidya Maya will thus never be able to help one in obtaining emancipation, as it only binds the mind 
and absorbs it in the crude things of the world, which make it more crude and increase the influence of Prakriti over it. To steady the vacillation of the mind, to concentrate the mind, to make the mind more subtle, are the ways to achieve freedom from the bondage of Prakriti. One who pursues a Vidyamaya would not be able to achieve any of these. A mind absorbed in the crude objects of the world will only become more crude, as vacillation will increase and concentration become an impossibility. Such a mind will never be able to achieve emancipation and become free of the bondage of Prakriti. Abandoning the pursuit of a Vidyamaya is thus imperative for achieving emancipation. Unit consciousness secures release from the bondage of Prakriti and attains a supreme rank with the practice of sadhana, intuitional practice. Consciousness is subdued wherever the influence of Prakriti is greater. Consciousness is absolute knowledge, jnana, which includes intuition and intellect. Hence, the greater influence of Prakriti leads to greater ignorance as consciousness gets subdued. Decreasing the influence of Prakriti will naturally lead to greater wisdom and clear reflection of consciousness because the influence of Prakriti is the reason for ignorance. Intuitional practice removes or decreases the influences of Prakriti and would obviously lead one to greater knowledge, jnana, and a clearer reflection of consciousness. Sadhana, intuitional practice, is waging war against infinite Prakriti and becoming free of our subjugation by winning this war. Prakriti is a unique force that controls everything, even natural phenomena. Sadhana or intuitional practice, therefore, means achieving supremacy over this all-controlling unique force, Prakriti. It was seen earlier that consciousness, Purusha, and Prakriti are inseparable. Prakriti, which was the controlling entity of Purusha before the war, comes under Purusha's control on being defeated in the war. Consciousness, Purusha, thus becomes the master of the all-controlling unique force with the help of sadhana, or intuitional practice. Due to its victory in the war against Prakriti, it leaves Prakriti unable to exercise any influence over Purusha. Sadhana, or intuitional practice, will make one the possessor of immense supernatural powers. Sadhana begets supernatural power. What its correct and proper use is, has to be determined. The supreme rank of Brahma is non-qualified Nirguna, where Purusha and Prakriti are together. Yet Purusha, consciousness, is more prominent and Prakriti is not able to qualify Purusha. Prakriti, being feebler in Nirguna Brahma, non-qualified entity, could be driven about by Purusha, consciousness. He could lord it over Prakriti. Yet Purusha, consciousness, does not do so. In the absence of Prakriti's influence over consciousness, the wish to lord it over Prakriti would not be aroused in Purusha. Such a desire in consciousness will only arise upon being influenced by Prakriti, which will only be possible when consciousness becomes weaker than Prakriti. Hence, even the desire to lord it over Prakriti will arise only out of the weakness of consciousness, which will bring Purusha under Prakriti's influence and render Purusha incapable of lording. Consciousness Purusha is thus never able to lord it over Prakriti. Unit consciousness gets release from the bondage of Prakriti gradually. The use of this Purusha begun power of sadhana for lording it over Prakriti would be inviting back Prakriti's influence. It is a qualifying influence of Prakriti only which creates the desire for the use of power. Hence, by wishing to use or by actually using this power, one voluntarily gets under the control of Prakriti. This results in all one's effort to conquer Prakriti with the help of sadhana, intuitional practice, being counteracted by going under the control of Prakriti. There is no emancipation for such a person. One can never gain freedom from the influence of Prakriti in this way. People use the power that comes from sadhana 
in order to win the admiration of others. The exhibition of one's supernatural powers will make others extol respect or even worship one. Others will look upon one as a great devotee, sadhaka. This is the only reason behind the display of one's powers. A desire to command respect and devotion from others is only being entrapped by vanity, mana, and pride, mada, of avidyamaya. And the pursuit of avidyamaya leads to degradation. Hence, any use of supernatural power brings one under the control of avidyamaya, which inevitably leads to a fall and to degradation. Many consider it proper to use the power begotten of sadhana to alleviate suffering, for instance, to provide relief from a serious disease. There is hardly any logic behind it. Everyone has to bear the consequences of their actions, and disease, suffering, or calamities are only different forms of suffering those consequences. Bhagavan, God, is benevolent, and it is according to his laws that one has to suffer the consequences of one's actions. It is through this suffering that one can take a lesson to abstain from evil. That is the purpose behind God's making one suffer the consequences. Interference in this divine law with the help of supernatural powers acquired through sadhana is not benevolence. The reaction to one's actions, karma fala, will have to be experienced. And it is not within the authority of even the greatest of devotees, sadhakas, to stop this. This may at best be able to postpone the suffering, but the performer of the actions will have to suffer the remaining consequences and may have to seek rebirth for this. As a punishment, suffering from a serious disease may awaken the desire for sadhana, intuitional practice, to achieve emancipation. But many strain and ignorant disciples deprive people of the opportunity of arousing this awakening by relieving them of their suffering with the help of their sadhana-begotten supernatural powers. They in fact do greater disservice than service to the sufferer. The use of sadhana-begotten power has to be regarded as a blasphemy. For is it not challenging the supremacy of God by neutralizing the effectiveness of the laws of His nature with the help of supernatural powers? One may cross a river by walking on water, may walk through raging fire, or may even perform the miracle of curing one of an incurable disease. One would invariably be using one's power to nullify the nature dharma of water and fire and to interfere with the law of prakriti, which makes one suffer reactions of all one's actions. Anyone walking on water in a river must be drowned. Fire has a property of burning whatever may come in its contact. Similarly, one has to bear the consequences of one's actions. To evade these effects is to challenge the authority of God. It is not merely challenging, but demolishing the very constitution of creation and its laws. There could be no greater blasphemy. Every action will have a reaction, and that has to be experienced. Use of supernatural powers is also an action. It is not only an action, but a blasphemous action, an evil deed. One is bound to suffer the consequences of such an action. And as long as one has not exhausted the experiencing of all the potential reaction, samskara, one cannot obtain freedom from the bondage of prakriti. Hence, the use of supernatural powers bestowed by intuitional practice is not justified under any circumstance. It invariably leads to downfall and degradation. And so it is essential to refrain from the temptation of using such powers. Emancipation can be achieved by intuitional practice, sadhana, and so there must be a special technique for it. This can only be taught by one who knows the technique. It is, therefore, necessary for learning intuitional practice to find a teacher who knows this technique. Does it then mean that a preceptor guru is absolutely necessary for learning intuitional practice and obtaining emancipation, or can one learn it oneself? A man in prison 
with his hands and feet shackled, will never be able to set himself free in spite of his best efforts, unless someone else opens the prison gates and removes his shackles. Similarly, people have been shackled by Prakriti and imprisoned in this wide prison, the world. It would never be possible for them to become free without the help of another person. Besides this, it is not possible for anyone to learn an art all by themselves. One must have someone who can teach them or whom they can imitate. Such a person from whom one can learn an art is a preceptor. Intuitional practice sadhana is also an art and has to be learned from a preceptor. Hence, emancipation is not possible without a preceptor, guru. A guru is always a prime necessity for obtaining emancipation. One who is in bondage cannot release others from bondage. One with shackled hands and feet cannot remove the shackles of others. Hence, the person who is not emancipated cannot give emancipation to others. Only a mukta purusha, emancipated person, is capable of becoming a preceptor. A person can be called emancipated only when he or she has obtained freedom from the qualifying influence of prakriti. The only entity which is completely free from the influence of prakriti is the non-qualified supreme entity, Nirguna Brahma, and it alone can be called really emancipated. Nirguna Brahma, or the non-qualified entity, can however never be instrumental in giving emancipation to others. It cannot, in the complete absence of the influence of Prakriti, have even the will to wish for the emancipation of others. Only that person can be a preceptor who by his or her sadhana intuitional practice has attained the supreme rank, but also has, as his or her own instance, taken human form again for a predetermined period for the welfare of living beings. Such a person will be under the influence of Prakriti as long as he or she maintains his or her physical body and, on his or her, relinquishing it with death, he or she will return to the supreme rank, the non-qualified supreme entity. The qualified supreme entity, Bhagavan, is emancipated and so is the preceptor, Guru. That shows that there is no difference between the preceptor and Bhagavan. He or she cannot be any other entity except the qualified supreme entity, Saguna Brahma. He or she is thus Saguna Brahma, or Bhagavan incarnate. The wish of the qualified supreme entity, Saguna Brahma, is to obtain emancipation for each of its units, and it is with this intention that it brought forth the creation. Saguna Brahma is formless. It cannot be seen or heard. Such an entity cannot help humans to achieve emancipation. It has to assume a human form to help its units, and that is the form of a preceptor, Guru. The preceptor, Guru, is Bhagavan incarnate. There is not the slightest doubt about this. Although it is difficult to find a Mukta Purusha, or Sadguru, great preceptor, it is not necessary to search for one in jungles, mountains, and caves in accordance with popular belief. The purpose of the qualified supreme entity in manifesting the creation is to obtain emancipation for each one of its units. In order to fulfill this purpose, it will have to appear before anyone who has a yearning for emancipation. This yearning, or state of mental uneasiness, caused by the intense desire for emancipation, heralds the arrival of the opportune moment. The qualified supreme entity, in the form of a great preceptor, will appear to those who have reached this opportune moment by virtue of their intense desire for liberation. If this were not so, the purpose of the creation would not be served. It would be merely a trap, and the creator, the qualified supreme entity, would become the cause of bondage. Hence, to wander through jungles and over mountains in quest of a great preceptor is futile. What is most essential is to kindle in one's heart a yearning and intense desire for emancipation. It is necessary to know what the qualities of a great preceptor are, so that even the ignorant may recognize that person. Is the possession and display of supernatural or divine powers 
the characteristic of the great preceptor, Sadguru? A great preceptor is an emancipated person and is master of all the supernatural powers. But does one have to display them to be recognized as a preceptor? We saw earlier that the use of supernatural powers under any circumstances leads to degradation as they bring the user under the control of a vidyamaya. But a vidyamaya cannot attract or have any influence over a liberated person. Such a one would not be influenced by a vidyamaya under any circumstances. Thus, the person who claims to be a great preceptor because of supernatural powers or who displays them is only an imposter. Such a person is not emancipated and can never liberate others. Such a person should be avoided like a venomous serpent. The display and possession of supernatural or divine powers are not the qualities by which a great preceptor can be recognized. A great preceptor is an emancipated person. A preceptor is free from the influence of prakriti. A vidyamaya cannot entrap a sadguru. The six enemies, kama, longing for worldly objects, kroda, anger, loba, avarice, moha, attraction, mada, pride, matsarya, envy, and the eight fetters, laja, shame, baya, fear, grina, hatred, shanka, doubt, kula, high descent, shila, complex of culture, mana, vanity, and jukupsa, hypocrisy and backbiting, have no effect on an emancipated preceptor, Sadguru. In order to follow the Dharma nature of creation, a Sadguru lives in complete harmony with Vidyamaya and practices Viveka and Vairagya, discrimination and proper use of worldly things. Such a person alone is a great preceptor, Sadguru. Intuitional practice, Sadhana, has to be learned from a great preceptor, Sadguru. And emancipation is obtained by its systematic practice. Nothing can be achieved by merely depending on the preceptor without carrying out intuitional practice, sadhana. Everyone should carry out intuitional practice. Emancipation is not possible without it. Some people have the erroneous impression that they do not have to make an effort and that they will attain emancipation due to the grace of the preceptor. It is true that liberation is not possible without the great preceptor's kindness. But one is mistaken if one thinks that liberation can be obtained without effort. One must deserve kindness, and then alone will it be bestowed. It is never showered on an undeserving disciple. To deserve the grace of the Sadguru, one has to follow the system of intuitional practice with devotion and faith, and not assume that the great preceptor will freely give everything without any effort on the part of the disciple. Other people think that since they are the disciples of a great preceptor, and since the Sadguru has come to elevate the fallen, the preceptor will take them all along when leaving, in the same way as a cowherd gathers together all grazing cattle before leaving the pasture at dusk. This way of thinking is not correct. A great preceptor does not come into the world to herd his disciples like cattle. The great preceptor comes to liberate people to elevate them to divinity. People must make a sincere effort to carry out intuitional practice, sadhana. Idle dependence on the preceptor cannot obtain emancipation. When one first starts intuitional practice, problems arise and present obstacles to its pursuit. Sadhana intuitional practice is the effort to free oneself from the bondage of prakriti. This subjugation is maintained due to the self-created distortions in the mind. In order to obtain liberation, the mind has to be restored to its natural state by removing these distortions. It was shown earlier that these are the reactions of one's actions and cannot be removed without being experienced. So emancipation is not possible until one has completely experienced the remaining reactions of one's previous lives. Ordinary people experience these reactions in the normal way. And if any still remain, when they die, they are reborn to exhaust them. Those who pursue intuitional practice do not want to be born again to experience their remaining reactions. 
In their eagerness to attain emancipation quickly, they hasten to exhaust the balance of reaction in this life. So they should regard problems as a good sign, as they speed up the exhaustion of the remaining reactions. Sadhana is the effort to free oneself from the qualifying influence of prakriti. A vidyamaya is also a quality, and that too has to be renounced. If a tenant has been occupying a house for a very long time, it will be extremely difficult to suddenly evict him by force, particularly if he has been treated as a respectable tenant for a long time. He will never leave the house willingly and will place all sorts of obstacles in your path. You will have to fight against all his maneuvers, and only when you have completely defeated him will the bully allow you to enter the house. Similarly, as one has been at the mercy of a Vidyamaya for many lives, it will not leave easily when one starts intuitional practice. Like the bullying tenant, a Vidyamaya will throw all possible obstacles across one's path when one tries to destroy its influence. Sadhana or intuitional practice, as taught by a great preceptor, is the way to remove a Vidyamaya. Only success in Sadhana can make a Vidyamaya loosen its hold. So the beginning of true sadhana is marked by a great resistance from a vidyamaya, which through the obstacles it creates, tries to compel one to give up sadhana. In its attempts to subdue a vidyamaya, sadhana will naturally meet resistance from the evil force of a vidyamaya. Obstacles in sadhana, intuitional practices, should be regarded as an indication of one's success in one's attempt to remove a vidyamaya. Obstacles are not created by God or the great preceptor, Sadguru, as they wish every one of the units to become emancipated like themselves. They are created by Prakriti, against whom one is waging war. If one is to win, Prakriti has to be defeated with the weapon of Sadhana, against which a Vidyamaya defends itself by placing obstacles in one's way. Obstacles in Sadhana should be regarded as good signs indicating that the influence of a Vidyamaya is beginning to wane. The qualified supreme entity, Saguna Brahma, has given each of its units a fully reflected consciousness. It manifests creation and evolves humanity in it to enable the unit to carry out intuitional practice and attain emancipation. Other living beings do not possess a fully reflected consciousness and are capable neither of performing sadhana nor of attaining emancipation. Unit consciousness is fully reflected in all human beings, and thus everyone has an equal right to practice sadhana. No other living beings, till they are evolved to the stage of human beings, have the capacity to perform intuitional practice. As everyone has an equal right to do sadhana, it is necessary for Saguna Brahma, qualified supreme entity, to reach everyone as a great preceptor. But this does not happen, because due to people's lack of interest in achieving emancipation, they are not able to claim the right to sadhana. The great preceptor is available only to those who have an earnest desire for emancipation. For them only, the opportune moment has arrived, and they alone can claim the right to sadhana and find a great preceptor, said Guru. Human beings have the power of discrimination as they possess a fully reflected unit consciousness. They can discriminate between good and evil and choose to live a good life. The desire for emancipation is good, but as every action or desire has to have a cause, so this desire also has to be aroused within human beings. Developing an earnest desire for emancipation or earning the right to do sadhana, therefore, depends on one's efforts. The great preceptor cannot be accused of partiality because of teaching intuitional practice only to those who really deserve it. Saguna Brahma wants to liberate everyone, but one must earn the right to do sadhana by one's own efforts. As, although all human beings have a fully reflected consciousness, many are not able to develop the earnest desire for emancipation. God cannot be blamed for human indifference towards attaining emancipation, which prevents one from finding a great preceptor. It is everyone's duty, dharma, to create the desire for emancipation, as that is the wish of the Lord, and that is why the Lord, 
made the vast creation. The aim of Saguna Brahma is to liberate each of its units, and that is the only reason it made this vast creation. Everyone will gain emancipation sooner or later, as that is the wish of the Lord. It may happen soon, or it may come about after an indefinite period. The only way to gain emancipation is through sadhana. And so everyone will have to begin sadhana one day in their search for liberation from the bondage of creation. The wise should therefore start sadhana as soon as possible and gain emancipation quickly. They realize that to delay is to suffer unnecessarily under the bondage of creation, which is not their permanent home. To regard a transit camp as one's home and suffer the rigors and difficulties of the camp is foolish, knowing that this is not the final goal and that one has no right to stay here permanently. It seems sensible to make an effort to leave as soon as possible. Everyone has to reach his or her goal sometime. It is imperative for everyone to achieve emancipation quickly by practicing sadhana. This is our permanent duty. Thank you.